Yep. All right. Okay, I'd like to call the April 13th meeting of the NCIP to order. Uh, if we could have roll call, please, Fatima. Aguahito Oaks. Alta Mesa. Present. Casanova Oak Knoll. Here. Deer Flat. Here. Del Monte Beach. Here. Del Monte Grove Laguna Grande. Here. Downtown. Here. Fisherman's Flat. Here. Glenwood. Here. Monterey Vista. Here. New Monterey. Oak Grove. I think New Monterey's connecting. <laughs> okay. All right. Oak Grove. Here. Old Town. Here. Skyline. Good evening. And Via Del Monte. Here. Okay. Great. It appears we have a quorum in person and sufficient for the overall. So let's go ahead and get started. First item on the agenda is public comments. This is for anything, anyone could speak to us on anything that's in the preview of the NCIP for three minutes, as long as it is not on tonight's agenda. So if you are in the council chambers, please come forward. And if you are on online on Zoom, please raise your hand. And let me make the uh, the announcement. Oh, and we'll yeah, let you him. need to do that first. Sorry. Yes, um, the in-person rules, the city of Monterey is committed to the safe attendance of its public meetings. Masks are encouraged for all who attend in person, regardless of vaccination status, but not required. Uh, we ask that attendees in the council chamber keep their phones and devices muted to prevent audio interference and feedback with the hybrid meeting. And then the Zoom procedures, the city of Monterey seeks to continue to offer virtual methods for public participation in meetings. If you aren't joining us in person here in the council chamber, there are two ways to virtually participate in this meeting. You may join the meeting directly on Zoom.gov using the Zoom app on your computer or mobile device, and you can also call in to the Zoom meeting. To join the meeting on Zoom on your computer, smartphone, or telephone, use the link or phone number on the agenda at iSearchMonterey.org. To call into the Zoom meeting, dial toll-free 833-568-8864, and then enter the meeting ID, which is 161-843-6636, and the pound symbol. And if prompted to enter a participant ID, press the pound symbol. Detailed instructions on using Zoom are available at monterey.org forward slash public meetings. And they're also uh, presented at the beginning of the agenda this evening. To make a public comment using the Zoom app, you can virtually raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. If you are dialed in by telephone, raise your hand by dialing star nine, and then unmute yourself when called upon by dialing star six. You must do both. Public commenters will be muted until it is their turn to speak, and public speakers will be called in the order their hands are raised. Please stay within the time limit established for tonight's meeting which we will show using a countdown timer on the screen. If you are connected live on Zoom, the timer is accurate with no delay. Tonight's meeting is also streamed live on the city's YouTube account, which is accessible at youtube.com forward slash city of Monterey with an approximate 10 second delay and also on Comcast channel 25 with up to a 90 second delay. As always, we look forward to receiving your public comments. Okay, now I jumped again. Now we'll go to public comments. And I do see two hands raised online. Uh, the first one is a phone that ends in 902. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute them, Fatima. Yeah, they're unmuted. Okay, go That's ahead. Hi. Great. Uh, this is Nina Beatty. I had several items. Um, first one is that Assembly Member Don Addis introduced AB 444 um, recently. It, this is state funding 
for developing Pentagon infrastructure and projects in the city, not on base, but in the city. And this includes funding environmental review. The projects uh, include 5G towers, roads, energy infrastructure, et cetera. So this is a new shift from uh, the, to having the state fund these projects and to put them actually into the community rather than on base. Secondly, the wireless ordinance was adopted last week. It now exempts government antennas from any review, public notice, or hearings. That includes MPUSD antennas and military antennas or cell towers. There are other new exemptions that allow these to be built without your knowledge. Home values typically decline near wireless infrastructure, and sellers must declare nearby cell towers and antennas under the neighborhood section of the California Real Estate Disclosure. Thirdly, the recent storms down branches and power outages caused electrical surges and overvoltage conditions. PG&E electric smart meters are not grounded and have little surge protection. This can result in surges and overvoltage causing burned wiring, destroyed electronics and appliances, and house fires, where the overvoltage can flow into buildings. Analog meters are grounded and route overvoltage into the ground, preventing fires and electrical damage. You can opt out and get analog meters for your home. Um, I have a report that uh, includes information from electrical engineers and other experts on my website, smartmeterharm.org. That's smartmeterharm.org. Finally, I request that um, in, I think it was 2009, I asked um, for uh, funding for training for staff members, and I was told that the NIP program uh, doesn't allow training programs or education to be funded, and I ask that that be, be changed um, because there are valuable um, trainings available that would help staff become uh, certified, for instance, in permaculture design, which would be a real benefit for the city um, and could be an additional draw for uh, visitors coming to this area and seeing Monterey being an exemplar of outstanding uh, landscaping practices. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Beebe. And actually on the third item, uh, what can be covered is covered in the charter, where, which has the NCIP. And so it would take a charter amendment to change it to include training, just so you know. That would be a good idea. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other hands raised in general attendees. Is there anyone at the, at the podium? There is not. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. One. Yeah. Is there someone? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Terry Pipes. Um, I'm a retired school teacher for MPUSD. I taught here for 38 years. Maybe I taught some of your kids. I don't know. Taught at Colton and taught at Seaside High. Um, in my retirement, I have come to enjoy bike riding. And one of the things that I want to speak about is the lack of bike paths from where I live, Oak Knoll, Casanova, Oak Knoll, down to the bike path. Every Thursday, I have the pleasure of riding with a partner. Um, and I have to take Casa Verde. And if any of you have gone down Casa Verde, you know it's very crowded. And so we have a proposal that perhaps, at least I hope so, that the, the center bike trail that is on Fremont, thank God it's gonna be connected north, be nice if it would be connected south as well, and therefore would go up Casa Verde through the fairgrounds and then over to Sloat and then right down there to the trail. I wanna read something that was written recently. We all did that survey um, about what, how we would like our neighborhoods to improve. And one of the quotes on the survey said, protected bicycle lanes in center median offer safe connections towards downtown, but they don't. That's not true. So I'd like to see that become true. And it's another thing about our beautiful city, Monterey, that I just think we can do more with bike paths, encouraging people. I went around my neighborhood, I got signatures. Some people said they'd come tonight, but they didn't. But one man, Mark, who said his wife um, has a flu and therefore he didn't want to expose everybody, said that he was riding down Casa Verde and a door opened and he hit it. And he ended up in the hospital because of it. 
I wanted him to speak tonight about that, but he's sick. So anyway, that, that's why I'm here. And I think that's the end of it. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else lining up, Tom? No one else. Okay, then we'll close the public comment section. And do you have any uh, first agenda item is approval of the minutes from February 23rd meeting. Does anyone have any questions, comments, changes to that? Okay, I don't see anyone with a hand, hand raised. No hands raised. Okay, do I have a, do I have a motion? We're a lively crowd tonight. Yeah. So moved. I move that we approve the minutes. I second. Okay. It looks like it's Jeannie and Jean. Jamie and Jean. Jamie, yes. Jamie and Jean, excuse me. My head is south of the border, too. <laughs> uh, it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the February 23rd meeting. Uh, any further comment? Seeing none, uh, roll call, please. Alta Mesa? Aye. Casanova Okno? Aye. Sierra Flood? Aye. Del Monte Beach? Aye. Del Monte, Del, Del Monte Grove Laguna Grande? Aye. Downtown? Aye. Fisherman's Flood? Aye. Glenwood? Aye. Monterey Vista? Aye. New Monterey? Aye. Oak Grove? Aye. Old Town? Aye. Skyline? Aye. Via Del Monte? Aye. Thank you. Motion carries. Minutes are adopted. Um, do you have any staff informational reports for us? Um, yes, we do. Just um, wanted to inform everyone that the conflict map is in the process of being prepared. So we're on top of that this year. Um, also reminder, just that the active projects update um, is available at monterey.org forward slash NCIP. And we have listed the active projects and the completed projects since April of 2020. Um, we also had, a, I'm going to ask Reggie to come up and just explain. Reggie's been here um, since January and he's took an, he's made a big dent in getting a lot of our projects underway. So I just wanted him to have an opportunity to give an update what was going on in that. We'll take just a minute or so. Thank you, Reggie. All right. Good. <clears throat> All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Reggie Paulding, um, project manager for NCIP projects. Um, I'll just start here first with the uh, the ones that were approved in, uh, I guess, the last round, 23, 22-23. So uh, project 2301, accessible beach mats. Uh, we've selected a vendor and two locations for the installation of the beach mats. And they uh, order was placed uh, earlier today, April 13th. Uh, project 2306, uh, El Dorado tree removal, uh, that's been completed. Project 2310, Laguna Grande Park, parking lot lighting. Uh, met with the city uh, consultant on site yesterday um, and the neighborhood rep. Uh, we're looking at options and we're going to start a lighting study for uh, for that. 2312, the American Legion uh, to Harrison uh, walkway. It's a combined path and uh, staircase. The stairs look like they're in good condition to me. Um, I think that we can make some improvements on the path, but uh, yeah, that, that project needs to get uh, designed and started. But that should be pretty straightforward. Project 2316 uh, is the Church Street Raised Crosswalk. Uh, we're at 90% on the plans. Uh, we should be at 100% next week. Plan is to start construction in June. 
with the completion before first day of school in August. Uh, project 2318 uh, is a Hartnell crosswalk, um, flashing beacons. Um, we've uh, placed the order for the equipment uh, at the end of February. So that should be, uh, we should get that equipment soon and move forward with installation. Um, 2320 Prescott Avenue sidewalks. That those side that sidewalk uh, extension has been included in the upcoming sidewalk project, and that should get done this summer. Twenty three twenty one Pacific Street Light. I think that's on the agenda tonight. Uh, needs additional funding, but once we get the funding, we'll be ready to move forward with the with that project. Twenty three twenty two is the Capital Site Master Plan. Uh, the Parks and Rec Department have placed the uh, RFP. Proposals are due on April 30th, and their target timeline is project July 1 to December 31 this year. 2323 Skyline Forest Drive, Home and Highway Bridge. Um, we've reached out to Caltrans to uh, work with them on an inspection and, and path forward for that one. 2324, which is a citywide restroom study. Uh, we've compiled a list of public restrooms uh, with the help of the Parks Department, and uh, we're going to be moving forward with that. 2325 Larkin Park Swings. Um, so we were able to work out an access agreement with the Monterey Peninsula Unified School District. They're going to provide full access to the uh, playground area. Currently, they're in progress with installing a new fence line. So once that's complete, then Parks and Rec can take a look at the park space and see what to do to, for upgrades. Uh, 2326 is Casa Verde Highway 1 overpass. I met on site with the city consultant and uh, uh, proponents for the project. We're going to make some modifications. Um, and and move forward with that. 2328 Don Davi Creek Path Design. Uh, I met with the uh, Monterey Police Department representatives uh, earlier this month and have some uh, ideas on how to modify that and but move forward. 2329 is Dry Creek uh, Road Storm Drain. Great uh, upgrade that's, that was completed. And then some of the previous uh, projects that were still on, on the books, we have uh, traffic calming plans for Monterey Vista and Fisherman Flats. Uh, those are being finalized and will go to city council on May 16th um, for approval. Aeneas Bridge uh, study has been completed and we're in the process of installing a temporary roof since I don't know if, if you're aware, but the, the roof that was there blew off in the series of storms. And uh, so we're going to put a temporary roof on and then uh, we'll need significant funding for extensive work that's needed at the Aeneas Bridge um, for the next round. And um, there was an Cos Casanova Oak Knoll had requested an oak study. Uh, samples were collected earlier, uh, I think in March, and we're waiting on sample results to find out what's what's happening with the oak trees. So stay tuned. And finally, I think the majority of the fuel reduction projects have been completed, right? So that's it. <laughs> uh, the place that was selected for the beach mats is the Del Monte Beach, right? So there's two locations. One will be, I guess, at the beach house um, off of the rec trail. And then the other, there'll be another location centrally located at what Tide Avenue. Uh, okay, so we'll do both locations. Correct. Okay. And Reggie, the date on the Monterey Vista traffic calming review has changed from May 2nd to yeah, May 16th. Yeah, we, yes, yes. Okay, now I'll let our neighborhood know. Thank you. Okay. You. Tammy, you had your hand up. Do you still want to ask? Yeah, I just any chance to delay the thing on the fish flats. I'm going to be out of town from May 10th to the 31st. I, I, 
I guess we can look into it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just do it at a later date. Okay. Okay. Doing this. Uh, Tammy, you have your hand up. Four and a half. Yeah, years, I just eight years uh, like that. So a couple <laughs> weeks is going to make a difference. Thanks. Good point. I Go just ahead, wanted Tammy. to find out if Reggie could give me a call. I'd like to discuss. I I asked to be kept in the loop, and I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I didn't I, know any of this tonight. I called earlier today about the beach mats. Yes, I can call you. Thank I don't you. Know, I left the voicemail if you didn't receive it. Uh, you didn't call my home because I didn't get it and I was here. Okay. So the 373-2151, please call. Thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you, Tammy. <clears throat> Tom, any other staff reports? No, thank you. It's nice to have Reggie here, isn't it? Yeah, it's nice to actually have some projects that were just approved not that long ago actually be done. The Thank irony you. is, is the uh, eucalyptus trees behind the big one they took down, they came down in the storm and took the power out. So, <laughs> but uh, okay, next item is item two. Uh, you've got a city clerk presentation on Brown Act. Yes, thank you. And we have a recording. Uh, the city clerk was unable to be here tonight. He's off this week. So uh, we did not make the meeting last on the on March 30th uh, when she was scheduled to be here. And she's off today. So we were um, hoping to present it tonight. Um, there was a recording from the city council, the presentation she made to city council. Um, it's about three minutes long. The first minute um, is a lot of setup. But then um, the actual bulk of the presentation is two minutes long, so it's not that long. Um, and I'll be able to answer questions afterwards. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here, I think. I'm going to try. And then start this. Let me start this first. <laughs> Here we go. Oh. That's not. Can anyone hear that? Nope. No. Okay. Let's just pause it and then I'll I'll um do this verbally. But um the gist of it all, um, back in February, the last time we met at the end of February, there was a, a question that we had about whether we we're going to follow the um, new rules that had been put in place or the existing ones from the Brown Act that have been in place for many years. There's different requirements for um, attending both ways. Uh, the new rules, there are a lot of reporting requirements. You're not allowed to attend meetings remotely more than once. Well, we would have two meetings that you could attend remotely, but they couldn't be back to back. Um, so there are a lot of requirements for doing that. So the city determined that we're going to be running the meetings under the, the Brown Act requirements, which have been in place for many, many years. Um, the, one of the requirements you'll notice in one of the things that happened at the last meeting was just a notification on the agenda form, um, the physical locations of where people will be attending the meeting from have to be included on the agenda. Um, so we missed one, well, we missed um, also identifying the, the members who were participating remotely on the last meeting. So that's why we had to postpone that last time. Uh, moving forward, um, the requirement is just that there be a, a, a quorum present in the council chamber where the meeting is held. Uh, the people who are attending remotely are supposed to po post the agenda 72 hours in advance. Mm -hmm. And um, if anyone would like to attend at one of those locations, they're supposed to be allowed to um, attend. But and so tonight we've got the, the notification down and um, that's kind of it. So again, just recapping, if you are planning to attend a meeting in, not in person remotely, 
using Zoom in the future. If you could let us know as soon as possible and we can get that arranged, it has to be on the agenda um, with your the physical location of where you will be attending the meeting from. And then once that's done, you're able to attend as if you were here just as we've done in the past. So I'm pretty sure there's going to be questions. <laughs> <laughs> you could stop sharing your screen too. I... Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, anyone in the council chambers? Or I and I see Richard has a hand up also. So okay, I'll let you take handle who's going to talk first because I can't really see who has hands up in the council chambers. Dwayne and Jean do. But, okay, so we'll go Dwayne, Gene, and Richard. Okay, uh, so this posting at the location where the individual is doing Zoom, they are technically supposed to invite the or allow the public in? Correct. Kind of defeats ADA requirements, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that these rules are affecting the members of the committee. This is not for um, re commenters, the public. Correct, yes. So we'll continue with public comments as we have throughout COVID. That was, that was always part of the pre-pandemic Brown Act? Yes, yeah, the, the Brown Act was written to make sure that um all of the public's business occurred in a public setting. So the, the public, if you're watching from home, there's no problem at all with that. It's just really about the committee members and we have to make sure that eight of us are here on the night of any given meeting and then um, just make sure that the notice has been properly done. If it wasn't properly included on the agenda, you could still participate as a member of the public, but um, you wouldn't be able to represent your neighborhood um, it, unless it's it's included in the agenda packet. So we have to know that about a week or so in advance. Thank Dennis you. has his hand up. Richard? Yes, it's rather a crazy rule for somebody's MU compromise, whether you invite people into your living room or you join the meeting there. I don't see any masks there. So uh, uh, I can see there's a cost to participate. But Tom, can you tell me how many meetings uh, MU Compromised, if they're gonna be on Zoom, can actually vote in? That's, I, I'm not clear on that. So the question is how many meetings can you attend and, and participate in? Remotely. And vote. Remotely. Under the Brown Act rules, which we are following, you can attend all the meetings remotely as long as we meet the noticing requirements on the agenda. Right. And do you have to admit people into your home or can you have a distance? Um, the way the regulation is written, well, let's find out that detail. Uh, but the way the regulation is written, it's intended that if a member of the public were wanting to attend the meeting and didn't want to come here, that they would be able to attend. It becomes a physical meeting location. So yes, that would, uh, I think is the intent, but let's get clarification on that, Richard. Okay, and, and could you please clarify the remaining dates? Uh, I have so many date forms. I don't know which one's real anymore. Um, so uh, Richard, is the, the last meeting? agenda item is our meeting schedule. Uh, we haven't established that yet. Well, it's changed. So it's to answer right. your, your exact question of exactly when our meetings are. Okay. I appreciate that. All right. Chinier. And I'm not sure I'm ever pronouncing your name right. So I'm sorry <laughs> if I got it wrong. No, you got it right. Um, oh. I just wanted to clarify, I think last meeting, uh, we were told if we're participating remotely that we'd have to make sure our camera was on the whole time. Is that still um, the expectation? That was a requirement of the, the new regulations. So taking a step back in um, 
think it was November of last year, the governor passed a new, well, a new legislative act was passed um, that had different requirements. And that was what was discussed in February. The city has chosen not to follow that. So um, that is no longer included in the Brown Act requirements. So that's not a requirement at this point. So you can turn your camera off if you want to. Yes. And hey, then, any, anyone else have questions of Tom? Yes, Dennis. I, I think the way that the Brown Act is written is that if it's a member of the public, you don't have to make that a public meeting site. But if it's a member of the committee, you do have to make it a meeting site. So I attended one of the city council meetings and one of the rep, one of the city councilmen was in, she was in Washington, D.C. She had to say, yes, we have facilities. Yes, people could be here. Yes, if the public wants to be here, et cetera, et cetera, following the Brown guidelines. So in, in that sense, if we're off site, then that becomes part of the meeting site. And that's why this is set up this way. Thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is the spokesperson report. Uh, last meeting I indicated, I I think it was last meeting, uh, I would be having a meeting with the city. Yeah. I would be having a meeting with the city manager and city attorney uh, and Tom to discuss our concerns about the CW designation going away. We had a very lively discussion. Uh, it's really about not, it's a little bit about grand jury. It's more about the way the actual charter is written. Uh, the charter indicates that all projects will be in a neighborhood. Every area of the city is part of a neighborhood and we are appointed to represent a neighborhood. So basically, uh, I got nowhere on the CW designation and unless we wanted to do a really big battle, which we would probably lose, we do not have a CW designation anymore. However, I did bring up the aspect of we have projects that are in more than one neighborhood. So how do, what do we call those? So you're gonna notice, I'll notice there's a now a new designation called MN for multi-neighborhood. Uh, so projects that go into multi-neighborhoods will have an MN and it will indicate all the different neighborhoods that are, that are involved in that project. So uh, kind of a hybrid of where we were before. But for downtown, you have the sports center and everything that's in downtown is a downtown project and there's no way around it. So we can argue amongst ourselves on it, but literally it's going to go nowhere if we want to take it up the food chain. So I wanted to fill you in on it because we're basically, we're appointed to represent neighborhoods everywhere in the city as part of a neighborhood and if you're saying a city CW is not part of a neighborhood, basically you're now disenfranchising that project and it goes against the charter. And that's the issue that Grand Jury brought up was we had projects that were not in neighborhoods, but everything was supposed to be in a neighborhood. Any questions, Tammy? Sorry. Um, so if, for example, the beach mats, obviously it's not in Villa Del Monte neighborhood. So if you wanted something like that, would you go to that neighborhood and ask them to submit a project in their neighborhood? How, how does that work? No, you submit just as you did before. It will be the designation will be determined by where it physically is located. I see. OK, thank you. Yeah. Like right now, anyone can submit a project and they're not necessarily specifying where it is. So that's really not any different. And I see a hand up in the council chambers. Spell. Go ahead. Um, 
I'm glad you brought this up because Kurt and I talked about this yesterday. And um, when we went through all the different projects, you know, for downtown, um, you know, first of all, we wanted to clarify, we are definitely not anti-park rec. Um, mm -hmm. But in, in the downtown, what seemed to happen is that the park and rec projects kind of dominated um, all of the downtown projects. And so in, in lieu of what you just said, if, if it can't be changed, can there be a designation where it's downtown resident and then downtown park so that you know it was a resident that submitted an application? Because otherwise, oh. downtown is just going to be eaten up with all the parks. And, and, and that's good. We're not, you know, we're pro Understood. But we're just trying to figure out how the residents don't lose their voice. Uh, I think on the actual application forms that we have, Tom, I believe it indicates who submitted it. Yes. So you will know that we, we all will know that on each application. Rick, I would point out there's nothing stopping us from the, changing the description to be anything we want. So if the we description could be anything. It's just the letter yeah. designator is it's got to be in a neighborhood. Correct. Yeah, leave the, leave the designator alone so it says downtown. But if the description or the title says CW mm -hmm. or citywide dash sports center improvement, um, that would still add the clarification that the downtown neighborhood is seeking. And it would still be allocated to DT. Mm -hmm. I, I, we could give it a shot and see. Yeah, okay, so if you're going to, um, you know, analyze all the, the I mean, or uh, review all the projects that are in a specific neighborhood, it kind of at this point, like downtown all of a sudden is going to get the lion's share and maybe not for the small projects that the residents are requiring. And we were happy, and, honestly, but um, just sort of want to make sure that the Can you turn your mic on? Because I have a hard time hearing you. Oh, sorry. We just want to make sure that the residents' voices don't get muffled. I, I would agree. At the uh, end of the day, uh, it's, it's incumbent on all of us as we're looking at projects to vote on to take into account what we feel is, you know, the best projects for the various neighborhoods, so... I said, I, we had a lively discussion because you know from last meeting where I stood on it, so. But it's a, uh, it went nowhere real fast. Okay, uh, let's move on to item four, which is the proposal to fund two cutoff projects. Thank you. And just uh, very quickly, this would be on, um, well, item number four in the agenda. And I'm just looking at the agenda report, um, which comes summarizes this. There are two projects um, that tied for first place on the cutoff agenda last year. Cutoff agenda was approved by city council last year when they voted on all of the NCIP program. From last year, there were 30 projects that were approved. There were five cutoff projects. Um, normally we have four, but last year there were several ties within there. So it ended up being five projects. But this evening we're coming to ask um, for support for the Casanova, for the, the first, the highest ranked projects um, were both tied with 74 votes last year. Um, the first is the Casanova Avenue sidewalk project. And the second one is the Via Paraiso Park. Um, it's called Striping Project, but it's to stripe the tennis courts um, and do some work there for the, the pickleball courts and the tennis courts that are there. So um, in the report, um, the Indian balance account is $569,000 today. Um, the Casanova Avenue sidewalk project is $260,000. And the tennis court or pickleball court striping project is $20,000. So that um, leaves the ending balance account at 289000 just a little bit over that. So there's still uh, sufficient funding to fund both of these projects from the cutoff list this year. And that then leaves the full uh, 
uh, contingency amount is still available as well for project overruns. That is correct. Okay. Okay, uh, first we'll go out to the public for anyone who has any comments on these, then we'll bring it to the count commission for internal discussion and comments. Is there any member of the public who wishes to address the proposal to fund the two cutoff projects? I don't see anyone online. Is there anyone coming to the podium? No one in the chamber. Okay. Uh, to the com committee members, any comments, questions, or motion? And uh, Richard. Yeah, the only question I have is the sidewalk project was the due diligence made in getting permission of the property owners. Don't know. Yeah, I. This is Scott Hanson, the representative. I have not yet reached out to the property owner on that project. I'm in in the middle of discussions with him on on another one, the radar speed sign. So the answer to that is no, but I've kind of paved the way. We could fund it contingent on getting that sign off. I'd be perfectly happy with that. Any other comments or questions? And his, has his hand raised. Go ahead. What is the amount in the uh, contingency at this point? Right today, it's uh, 500 and I flipped my page. 569, 317 and 14 cents. Oh, the contingency? I'm sorry, $530,000. What is that relative to the projects that are in process? 15%. Yeah, is, it, is the contingency adequately funded for what we have in front of us to build? Yeah, that that's we have not touched the contingency since last year. This is what um, council allocated back in September. Um, so we haven't had to touch that yet. So we have four to $5 million of projects approved in construction right now? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what the number is. Basically, our choice is if we fund these, it reduces, ending balance would go, ahead, go into the pot to fund the next round of projects. So the question is, do we fund the two cutoffs and there's money there to do it or does that funding roll over into the next cycle that's really our two options i i believe the question that i would have is you know hey we are speeding up on getting things done and uh, we had a lot of inflationary pressures in 22 so if we're speeding up and getting things done we're going to need all the money we had budgeted prior to the wonderful year of 22 and probably some more. So we had generally been trying to budget for a contingency fund, I thought, of 750000 or so. So that's why I was, I'm surprised that it's down to 530. And so I want to know that we've got enough to cover all the projects we might finish in this season. Yeah. So just to recap, last year in September, the contingency account was um, defunded back in 2020 when the COVID emergency happened. Um, so there was zero in it on February, on September 19th. After council approved it, they allocated $530,000 into the contingency fund, which is still there. And we would be, and I think the plan all along is each year putting more in. So question, I guess, that, that being raised is, is that 530,000 enough to get us through the end of the year? Or the end of the fiscal year, I should say. Right. And I think Dennis had another question. I, I recall a contingency balance was about 800,000 when the city took it away. So mm -hmm. I'm not 
feeling that 500, particularly in this inflationary time, is uh, a great amount of money for indentures. Okay. The um, also just to clarify again that the the funding we'll be using to fund these two projects is not the contingency account; it's the ending balance account, and the final value of that after this action would be um what was it 289,000 so all to, both accounts the contingency and ending balance would be i can't mm -hmm. do the math mm -hmm. on the spot it's so close i think to 800,000 thank I, you i'm going to correct my statement i think we we actually probably only have about 3 million of outstanding projects that have been funded right now so, and a bunch of those are studies and other things too. So we went through the whole discussion about how much to put in last funding cycle and settled on the 500,000 because of the mix of projects. So, but as Tom is saying, if we go forward and fund the two cutoff projects, there's still another 200,000 plus in ending balance. So in effect, we have close to the 800,000 in potential contingency funds if something were to really come up this year. Agreed. Richard. Yes, uh, I'm prepared to make a motion uh, uh, to pass the contingency uh, for the Casanova sidewalks. You mean the ending so, balance for, can, for it? Yes, yes, I but, move that. What about the other, the other project that tied with it? I'm for that too. So I would just, so you can make a motion for both of those? Yes. Okay, there's a motion. Is there a second? I'll to second fund the, the first cutoff projects with ending balance. I second it, Tom Raleigh. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Not a uh, roll call, please. Alta Mesa. Aye. Casanova Oaknell. Aye. Deer Flat. I support. Del Monte Beach. Aye. Del Monte Grove Laguna Grande. Aye. Downtown. Aye. Fisherman's Flats. Aye. Glenwood. Aye. Monterey Vista. Aye. New Monterey. Aye. Oak Grove. Aye. Old Town. Aye. Skyline. Aye. Via Del Monte. Aye. Thank you. There will be some very happy folks in the pickleball and, and parks and rec world. Because <laughs> that was the compromise that was worked out and it was kind of uh, not happy when it didn't get funded originally, but it just took a little while longer. Okay, uh, now we'll move on to the main item for tonight's agenda, which is item five, uh, which is the first state review of it's the committee's review of projects from Aguajita Oaks to Monterey Vista. Uh, the way we're gonna work it is we'll go neighborhood by neighborhood. Tom will do a intro, a quick intro of the projects for, that, for the first neighborhood. Then we will go out to the public for anyone who has any comments on those projects. Then we'll bring it back for the uh, committee for discussions and questions. This is a chance to for the committee members to ask questions, point out things related to the projects in their neighborhood or everything along those lines. Remember, they'll be back again for the general public comments uh, in a couple of weeks. So uh, let's get started. I don't believe we have any projects in Aguajito Oaks. For the, so the first neighborhood would be Alta Mesa, Tom. Thank you. I'm going to flip through that. So there was one project nominated from Alta Mesa this year. It's the Don Davi Creek Path construction. Uh, this would be to construct segment four, which is the light blue color um, and the trailhead improvements at Munras. This is actually phase two, I do believe. Huh. I think we approved phase one, which is the ADA previously. Okay. Just for a, a, on that, the number. That does make more sense. Phase one that I know was design and um, improvement. So we'll call this yeah. two. Thank you. 
I, you know, I really doesn't matter. It's, it's this segment. So, uh, Richard, do you still have your hand up for a reason or? Okay, we'll look at general public. Anyone wish to address uh, the I, the <laughs> projects, proposed projects in Alta Mesa? Okay, I, oh, I see uh, 902 has a hand raised. We can unmute. Go ahead. Thank you. Um I wasn't able to watch the the um, YouTube is not coming up with the meeting, so I'm I'm sort of blind as far as what's being shown on the screen. Um, what is the exact the extent of this path construction? Are there going to be tree re trees removed? Um, is this going to be encroaching on any sort of habitat for? I mean, the yeah. the deer and the squirrels and everybody are losing so much habitat, mm -hmm. and I'm uh, I this is this I is an existing roaming. path. Okay, and so it's and, and it's just improving. improving it. It's improving okay. the quality of it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, this is actually formerly known, uh, actually a signage calling it the Dundavi Creek Path. Okay. And Thank you me. can access it at Munris, and you can access it at the, where Dundavi makes the little bend. And it's yeah, pretty scary in some places. Like it was new. Yeah, no, this this is there. Most people have no okay. idea it's there, but it's a beautiful path. Okay, anyone else in the public? Um, uh, any member of the committee? No one's raising their hand. Okay, then we'll close this item. We'll go to the next neighborhood, Casanova Oak Knoll. Tom? Um, there are three projects for Casanova Oak Knoll. Thank you. We have the, the project number one is the Fairground Road Airport Road Lighting Project. This one came back um, it, from previously. I noticed there's a comment from the traffic um, staff reviewed the, the traffic related projects um, back in February, I believe. And the comment they came up with that um, this was police, fire, planning department, uh, public works, traffic, public works, engineering, and then public works, the parking division was also in attendance. And they looked at all the projects that were traffic related and came up with the following comment. They just said the staff recommends a scope be reviewed with the applicant to discuss options that are within the city right of way, include pedestrian scale bollards, placement on existing poles, um, prior to coming before the committee for voting. So that is that project. Uh, next project, Casanova Oak Knoll Park Improvements. This one is for um, the fence in front along the street. And then also there is a shade structure, um, uh, park bench, and concrete food prep table is that one. And then the final project in Casanova Oak Knoll is the North Fremont Ramona Storm Drain Improvements Project. Um, this is to remove puddling on the eastbound lane of North Fremont and uh, Ramona Avenue. So there's two sides from the intersection, just both these areas puddle. This was a question that came up last time. Oh. And those okay. are the three. All right, we'll go out to the general public for the three Casanova Oak Knoll projects. Any member of the public wish to address any of these three public projects? There's one. Uh, okay, go ahead. Robert Yoey, uh, Euclid Avenue, right across the street from Casanova Oak Knoll Park, and that's the project I'd like to speak to. Uh, we've been losing a lot of trees in the park, and if you're a family there and you're trying to prepare your meal, we have no shaded tables. And so just real quickly, we need those shade structures. Uh, you can't have a family picnic now because of what global warming is. We're, we're losing our trees. But what I'd really like to talk about is the fence. This started 
back in about 2012, the Cypress condominiums put up a chain link fence and the architectural design review committee made them tear it down and put up a vertical modern metal picket fence. Uh, part of the Cypress condominiums argument was, well, there's a chain link fence around the park. The architectural design committee said that should be replaced. We eventually got neighborhood improvement funds to replace the chain link fence around the community center. And what we have left remaining is 300 feet of chain link fence along Euclid Avenue. It's an eyesore. We have a school bus stop there and that's where all the kids throw their gum wrappers. They don't throw them in front of a nice metal picket fence or by the community center. Uh, I canvassed all the neighbors and the households facing the park. Over a month, I was able to get 10 signatures from the 13 residences. And online, I submitted the comments with the copy of the uh, petition from the neighbors to please repay, replace the fence. If you could, we would appreciate it. The Architectural Design Review Committee recommended it. The Department of Parks, uh, they uh, support replacing the chain link metal fence. It is an eyesore. It's hard to maintain. Uh, and lastly, the neighbors would really appreciate the chain link fence replaced. It's a true neighborhood community improvement project. Thank you. Oh, and if I could comment on one new project, I guess it's now called MN01. I don't know if I can sit through 85 or 86 more projects. I strongly support the bicycle path going downtown for my neighborhood. It's very dangerous to go down Ramona or Casa Verde and try to connect with the bike trail along the bay. We need a bike trail for our residents in our part of the neighborhood to be able to get downtown. So sorry for jumping ahead, but I really appreciate the fact that you can sit here and go through a hundred projects. <laughs> I don't know if I can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see anyone else rushing to the podium. So we'll bring it to the commission. Uh, Richard, do you have anything? Go ahead. And then anyone else in the committee? Let me, let me just review these projects quickly. Fairgrounds Road Lighting. If, if there's a lot of events there and residents do use it to go to different areas of the city, it is so dark. The police have requested the lights, but we need lights, not bollards. We need street lights. And because we have the high voltage poles along Fairgrounds Road, and there's a light every other pole. They're just so far apart. It's just a dead zone between it. And because of Fremont and the fairgrounds, we get sketchy people, makes people uh, unsafe walking along that sidewalk. We need to get the lights there. So that's one. The second one is the park improvements. That fence was funded. It was defunded like a lot of other NCIP projects. Uh, the shade umbrella is going over the concrete food table because right now it's the most popular park in the city for barbecues. It's booked every weekend during the season. The sun's so strong there that if you put potato salad out, it's pretty much ruined in a few minutes. Uh, we have a few umbrellas there. It's just to add a few. The bench goes next to the preschool for the waiting parents if we ever get our center opened again. Uh, and I put that as an if, but those, these are smaller projects, but have a big impact for us. Uh, the flooding is from Dundee to North Fremont Street. The drainage in the city, in our neighborhood, goes down to Fremont. It's the travel lane and the intersection at Ramona, at Grandma's Kitchen, gets several inches underwater and it closes the whole right lane of Fremont, uh, that street carries over 30,000 cars a day. So that sums up those three projects. I'll get to the bike path, which is an MN at another time later on. But if anybody has any questions, please ask them now. Because this is what kills projects when people have doubts and they don't express them right away. So um, I'll wait for others to speak up. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Any other member of the committee have questions or? Lee and Jamie have their hands up. Jamie. Just a quick one. Is this drainage project going to utilize that cool new idea of saturating the water in place 
as opposed to moving. And I remember along Fremont, we were looking at trees with special drainage barriers all around them, or is this just hooking up to the- I, I, I can address that, Jean. Uh, previously, we funded a project to put dry wells on Dundee, the size of a large truck underground filled with gravel and one on Lurwick. Uh, the project went from 50,000 to 600,000 and we found it only solves 5% of the drainage problem. We need a storm drain that fixes the problem. The dry well didn't, the amounts are too large. So even on a day when I drove by, one lane of Fremont was underwater. It was only a 10th of an inch of rain. That'll give you an idea of the scope of the problem. Thank you. My question is, um, I understand the lighting by fairgrounds and I totally agree with that, but the cameras, who's going to be monitoring that? Is it local neighborhood businesses, the police department? Who's going to be, or an outside company? Who's going to be monitoring those cameras? There, there are no cameras with this proposal. It's Is that asking, correct, Richard? It's asking That's correct. Put the lighting in the project. No, there's no cameras in this project. Okay. Yeah. It's adding, it's asking for it right in there. Any other questions? Well, it, it does look like it's it mentions in the write-up for the project cameras. So who's this? Uh, Kelly? It's not the original project. Uh, I don't know where that came from. Oh, okay. Fairground. Fairground, yeah. It says fairground. No, uh, it's not something that's been discussed with me. And I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I know the city doesn't do cameras. So all that's going to do is kill the project. So uh, until the city of Monterey agrees to monitoring cameras, uh, it's not possible. Let's just make sure it's not in any of the, that's noted that does not include cameras, Tom. Can, can Tom contact mm -hmm. Kelly at the fairgrounds to clarify yeah. this? Yes, we'll get a clarification. Rich, it's definitely in there. In, his, in the stated project that's in the book. Okay. Yeah. But what are the cameras supposed to go to and who's gonna monitor them? That has to be clarified. Yes. And I will point out that the model that a lot of C's are using and, and the one that's approved for our neighborhood is it's not monitored. It's only pulled in case of an event by the police. And we're looking at that a policy coming down from Saratoga to put it here in place here. So Tom, I have a question about COK5 because it says in there measure S may apply. Um, yes. Is there an answer on that? Uh, no, measure S, we should be able to um, do that. We'll check. Yeah. Well, if that's the case, we'll let you know at the next meeting. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's move on to Deer, Deer Flats. Deer Flats has three projects this year. The first is um, on Old Salinas Highway. This is an old project that was defunded um, and again, automatically returned to discussion this year um, to install pedestrian signage and lighting on Old Salinas Highway. Second project uh, we discussed last meeting, uh, Deer Forest Drive and Elk Run is the utility box relocation. Um, it would be to remove the boxes that you see in the photo um, over here, um, just to relocate them from the view when you're parking here, trying to turn onto Deer Forest from Elk Run, they, they impede your vision. And the final project, number three is the Return from 2020, this is the Deer Flats Park. Uh, it's reconfiguring the fences that are there and uh, turning the benches around to face the field instead of the street. So I'm not, I think we had a discussion about this before that uh, Deer Flats 1, um, is that 
a resident from your neighborhood, Tom Monsalis? So I'm just curious why this is a Deer Flats because it's not in Deer Flats neighborhood. It actually, I, I had to check the boundary of the map and it is currently in the Deer Flats. Along Monterey Salinas Highway? Yes. Okay. And it goes right up to the to Highway 68. Okay. Um, couple, couple clarifications to um, the Deer Flats 02, it is a resubmission, but the last time we submitted this, it was a, a sort of a, an additional phase to the intersection per improvement that was done. Um, it really made those utility boxes stand out once that bank was dug out a little bit and the retaining wall was put in. Um, but in the previous submission, it was actually for the city to maybe help fund some of those non-city owned boxes. So whether it's AT&T or whoever owns those boxes, that was cost prohibitive. Um, I probably should have clarified this. I, I was the submitter on this, that really what this is asking for is for the city ones, like the irrigation that we found, if we can move the city ones, which would reduce the cost, and then have the city and the community maybe petition the other owners of those boxes to ask if they could underground. If we see the city doing it, maybe it'll give incentive to the other owners of those utility boxes to either move them or underground them. So that's the okay. scope Got it. we're looking for on there. And then Thank the you. third one was just, yeah, it was one that didn't make the cut. I think it was close to a cutoff last year, but um, we um, are just resubmitting that for this year. Okay, let's open it up to the public for any comments on the Deer Flats projects. Okay, don't see anyone in the public, so now back to the commission. We've, anyone else wish to make any comments on the Deer Flats projects? Crickets okay. over here. Seeing Thomas, none. I do have a question. Oh, oh, sorry, Dave. Because uh, again, I, the Deer Flats one, I, I don't know who the uh, Doyle Daughtry is, but um, do we have a cost estimate for that? Do you know? No. Well, again, this year, the, the plan that we have right now is to um, estimate the cost of the highest ranking projects. So we're not doing all 100 of them. We can um, narrow it, unless all 100 how, get. How, how, wait, wait, wait. how are we? Okay. We, yeah. Let's not digress on that right now, but we determine how we vote very often on how much a project costs. Yes. We'll have a, like an S, well, a rough estimate. To okay. give a scale of what the cost of this project would be, um, but there won't be a detailed cost estimate on, until. So it'll be kind of like last year, where you yeah. guys guessed and gave us a number out of thin air. Yes. Okay. I hope there. So far, you haven't been too bad from what you did last year, but let's see. Uh, okay, we're done with. Let's go on to Del Money Beach. It has one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, seven projects. Seven projects. Yep. The first is the Spray Avenue Tot Lot Shade Structure, um, which is a project originally proposed in 2017. This was a funded and then defunded project to install a shade structure at the, the park there. Um, the second one is the Beachway Restroom Facilities Project, or Portland Lou. Um, this one also was a defunded project. The third project is a Spray Avenue Tot Lot. It's to resurface the play area, which is becoming worn. Uh, project number five, Del Monte Beach, was to uh, replace the Tide Avenue Boardwalk which is the, uh, the blue areas indicated there. Project number six is um, Surfway and Roberts Avenue. It's a fencing replacement project to replace the fencing that exists along the entrance and exit um, to Del Monte Beach neighborhood. Project number seven is the Beachway Boardwalk Extension. Um, and I don't know if you can see, but on the left-hand side of the sheet of the image here, there's a little blue section, which is where that would be. Um, 
to continue the boardwalk from where it ends currently down to the the hard sand there. Uh, Del Monte Beach project number nine is the boardwalk repair project. Um, this is the one where funding is um, allocated typically annually um, to repair the boardwalk. It's where, where it needs it throughout the year. And those are the seven Del Monte Beach projects. Okay, let's open it up to the general public. Anyone in the public wishes to address any of these projects? I don't see anyone online. Anyone in the council chambers? We have one. Okay. Hi, Richard. Um, this is Hans. I just have a question about the loo being, the Portland loo being mostly metal and being right on the beach, being an oceanographer and working close to beach environments, there's very high chance of rust. And I was wondering if there, we have any knowledge of how well these do right next to beaches where you have a lot of sand and salt blowing up because corrosion can be a real issue and whether this is even in one year going to be is whether such a loo would last more than a year or so. Yeah. Thanks. If I may, I can say that when we did research on it, uh, the Portland Loo Company felt very strongly that the multiple layers of, of, of baked on paint uh, would hold up very well underneath the salt. So, but, but there's more to it when we get to that. Richard? Yeah, uh, I've done extensive research on the loo. In fact, my research led to the one at Seminole Plaza, which has been there for over 10 years. But the basic material of the loo is battleship grade stainless steel. That's the reason we get it because it's low maintenance and the walls are stainless steel. The toilet is stainless steel. It has a built-in pressure washer Everything is stainless steel. Uh, it's probably the best one made so far. So my question, though, is I know it's controversial in this neighborhood. Did they get consensus on, on putting restrooms there? And we did put this under the class of the restroom study to know whether we should put one or two there. Uh, I don't know what the status of that is. Thank you. Um, it's one or two or none. And so I would circle the word pre uh, should precede construction. So if you look at the comments on your list, it says the study should precede construction. So I think the neighborhood's behind the idea that that study get done because it may be that that study says there shouldn't be a restroom there. So that's that's the neighborhood consensus on that right now. And I'll jump in too, as uh, Reggie mentioned earlier, that's in the process of we're starting that analysis. So um, we'll have more information as time goes on. Okay. Any other questions or comments on Del Monte Beach projects? Well, actually I didn't have a chance to comment on them. We wow. were oh, for comment discussion. You're too slow, Jamie. <laughs> I know, just give them a chance. So I just might make a couple of comments going down the list. Uh, Del Monte Beach, one shade structure, we're, we're willing to be flexible on that. The engineering idea that came back last time was very big, but even as something as small as an umbrella structure would be helpful because you can see by the picture, the baking a, a white light on that one table. Um, Beachway toilets, number two, we discussed that. Should proceed the study should proceed is probably a good guidance for us as a committee on that one uh tot loss area resurfacing so 2019 is when we first said you know that's got to be resurfaced and it's been four more years so it's looking pretty rough and then i wanted to clarify a couple things number five the best thing to do is circle in your notes the words some or all so that is going to be that whole block that that path was put in when I lived in the apartments in 89 or 90. So it's had a real good run, um, but we've had some really bad trips and falls and, and injuries now. And so the question is going to be for this committee, what can we afford? So we've got one in here to say, let's get the whole thing replaced because but the majority of that is still very, very old. And then we have a later one that says, well, if we can't afford that, let's just keep fixing it. 
So the number five is all. Um, project number six, um, that we calculate that the wooden railing on the uphill side is 40 to 50 years old. It is almost hollow in places and it just falls off because the nails no longer have any wood to hold on to. And so, but the parks is great. They, they find a new place to put a new nail in and they put the wood back up. I kind of think it's cool looking and beachy, but the rest of the neighborhood is saying that it's not safe if it's falling apart as you walk by it. So that's the the railing. Um, number seven, that beach boardwalk extension is the same place as the mats that were just ordered today. So I think maybe we leave it on the list and we see what the story is with the mats. And I'll go back to the, the submitter of this and talk to him about whether one, are the mats okay? So we don't need this or two, do we need some of this funding to transition from the existing boardwalk to the mats? So stay tuned on that one. Uh, number nine, that's portions. So we've been last year we got uh, $50,000 set aside to fix the walkway. If we, uh, this would be another asking for another little pot of money to fix the walkway, number nine. So, and that's the projects for the neighborhood. So any questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions or any hands raised. No. Okay, we'll move on to Del Monte Grove. Thank you, Del Monte Grove Laguna Grande. They have five projects this year. And the first is at Virgin Avenue and Grant. It's a memorial plaque. Um, Traffic did have a comment on this one, which was basically that the plaque is preferred over a sign, which cause, could cause confusion uh, for motorists and pedestrians and that. Uh, project number two is uh, a new one this year for playground improvements and outdoor musical instruments. Um, they were discussing the application mention, putting the, um, and instruments in this like a semicircle area that's located very well on the lake side of that, the playground area. Project number three is for the Casanova Avenue sidewalk construction project, which we approved this evening. So we'll remove that one. Project number four, also on the 500 block is to add a street light um, on an existing uh, utility pole there mid block and then project number five is uh, along Virgin Avenue is to, to widen the decomposed granite path that exists over there. Okay, that's so that's to, the, to the public for any comments on the Del Monte Grove Laguna Grande projects. I've got a, a 902 on the phone. Yes, this is Nina Beattie. I had a question about the um, the outdoor musical instruments as far as noise levels. Uh, do the neighbors want this that are living in apartments or homes adjacent to the park? Because those instruments could be played at all hours of the day and night and uh, could be quite annoying. So I, I don't know the sound levels, but um, it sounds like, um, you know, that could be an issue. That's it. Thank you, Nina. Any other member of the public? Okay, we'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, Tom, do you have an answer on noise level? I was gonna ask that question as well. No, I don't. Oh, we'd have to find out more about the types of instruments that they're proposing. I, I've never heard of an outdoor musical instrument. Yeah, it, we're gonna need a lot more info on that. Also, is all of that park in city limits? Yes, that okay. the the playground is in city limits, where that the the application proposed it. Let me go back up. Uh, oops, the city line is kind of along. Well, I forget what street then to Branner, right there. But the playground, all of the playground, is within the city boundary. Okay, just want to make sure. Yeah, I'll I'll jump to number two, and that concept did was new to me also. But it is an established part of um, 
playground equipment stuff, I guess. And on the seaside side of the park, there are there is you know it's a like um there's two of them, and one is keyboards, and another it's like wind something or other. I need to take another look, but it is manufactured by a playground equipment company. And I, I do share the, the the concern about the noise. The neighbor who submitted it is is passionate about it, so I'm uh, curious to see what we discover as we go forward. Does that is that consistent, Tom? <laughs> well, yes, yeah. And the, the, I guess the question is about the neighbors and whether yeah, and neighbors that's a, would be willing right. to support it. Yeah, exactly. And then Dennis also has a question. Thanks. Right, Dennis. Me? Uh, actually, in Washougal, Washington, there's a park that has this type of playground equipment in it, and it's very popular with the kids huh. and some adults who come by and play at night as well. It's not that terribly loud. Yeah, that's what I found at the, at the seaside side of it as well. It makes noise, of course, but it's not very loud. But yeah. <laughs> You're right. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Any other members of the commission have any questions or comments? Richard. Yeah. Just to point out that the seaside side doesn't have any homes adjacent to it. From this map that I see now, they're right next to it. So, uh, we definitely need to know how the neighbors feel about it. Yep, agreed. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to downtown. Okay, um, but before we jump in, can I make a comment on the first one? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not quite done. This is an old submission, and we do need something on that traffic circle, whether it's a plaque or sign. The support for the the memorial sign, as I guess the word is kind of has dissipated over time, and the the veteran members here may remember more will remember more about it than I do. But I'd suggest that we leave this in here, but have the option of maybe changing the wording. Um, and I'll talk to the neighborhood association about exactly how to proceed, but we do definitely need something on that on that traffic circle. Um, so that's all I had to say on that one. And the uh, Casanova, yeah, that's done. Virgin Avenue, we talked about the, the submission is a is a DG path kind of reconstruction. Yesterday, Tom and Reggie and I took a quick look at it and their suggestion was to, rather than DG, to put in a, a regular concrete curb and gutter. So I don't know if I can, if, if I can request a change of scope now or if we let that go until you know we further review, but it it would change based on our discussion. It would change from DG to concrete, mm -hmm. um, and that's five. Yeah, that that's it. Okay, I, I would think if it's still a sidewalk, changing it from DG to concrete. But if you're adding curb and gutter into it, it's it's becoming a very different project. <laughs> but that's yeah, that's just my view. So, suggestion: Do we have the two to do what the existing project, and then says an alternative what the alternative cost would be? Have like A and B that's good. same yeah. time, so we have a choice, mm -hmm. like a phase. Yeah. Could do that. Okay, any other comments on Del Monte Grove, Laguna Grande? Okay, downtown. 15 projects now in downtown neighborhood, as Bella mentioned earlier. 
lots. Uh, the first one is the oldest one on our list. It was approved in 1999 for the Monterey Bay Park to add a restroom there. Project number two is at the um, El Dorado Street, the 100 block driveway reconstruction project. Um, project number three is for Lake Edge Improvements, phase five, um, nominated in 2012. Project number four is for the Jack's Park. At the entrance, there's a baseball statue that um, is proposed to be relocated down to the entrance. Uh, project number six is the Hartnell Gulch Stream Restoration Project um, for construction, actually, of phase one of this project between Pacific and Hartnell Street. Project number eight is for more downtown public restrooms in Portland Loos. Project number nine is to add a shower station to the uh, Monterey Bay Park, which is right at the foot of the Commercial Wharf. Project number 11 is at El Estero Park Center. It's the facility improvements. This would be a facelift, um, largely um, interior improvements. This also, the Parks and Rec Commission met last evening and prioritized their top 12 projects. This was number two on their list of uh, priority projects this year. Project number 12, also at El Estero Park Center, it's for equipment upgrade. Um, this, the Parks and Rec Commission last night uh, prioritized this as project number five of 12, their top 12. So this is relatively high on their list. Project number 13 uh, was for also at El Estero Park Center or at El Estero Park to um, Improve the park course equipment that's located throughout the parks. This project was um, prioritized as project number 11 last night at the Parks and Rec Commission meeting. Downtown project number 14 is the El Estero Park barbecue area to add a shade structure there. Um, this was the Parks and Rec Commission's priority project number six last night. Uh, this was originally submitted in 2020. We discussed it last year. Project number 15 is for the Jacks Park to install artificial turf on the infield only. Um, this was the Parks and Rec Commission priority project number seven last night. It's also noted that it was uh, eligible for CDBG grant funding, which is a community development block grant, which is a federal program. Project number 16 is at the Solicito Ballpark, also at El Estero Park, uh, for lighting improvements to replace the lighting that's there. This is the Parks and Rec Commission had this as their fourth highest priority project. And then uh, project number 17, Dennis the Menace Playground. This was nominated this year as for a video surveillance um, installation. Um, and this is another one too that we have to note that there is no city policy currently on surveillance in public spaces. So um, if it were approved, it would have to wait until that occurred. So it could be a while. Project number 18 is at the sports center. It's to upgrade the bike rack to allow for um, more bicycles to be locked properly. Do it that way. And those are the 15 projects in the downtown neighborhood. We will open up to the general public for comments on any of the projects located in the downtown area. Uh, 902 on the phone. Go ahead. This is Nina BD again. Lots of interesting projects. Um, I think the shower station is a great idea. Um, it's a lot of parents, I think, will thank you for <laughs> getting sand off feet before they go into cars. Um, the Jacks Park artificial turf, I wonder, has the city investigated this or Parks and Rec investigated the toxicity? Artificial turf has been, at least in the past, made up of ground up tires, and there are a lot of toxic issues associated with it. Um, especially and including the eventual disposal. So I'm just curious if that's, you know, been looked into um, 
it's there are experts that say that it's not a good surface for kids especially to be playing on um, and also on the Hartnell Gulch a stream restoration project this has come up in the past and what is the motivation or rationale for doing this particularly the portion that's next to Hartnell um, this uh, habitat is has been existing and intact for many years um, I'm it's the the language of using saying that something is non-native is really strange because were people that are Esalen or Rumson Ohlone uh, involved in making this determination because otherwise probably me and everybody else in the city is not native so I don't understand the you know I I understand that there's ivy there but there are a lot of critters that use that as shelter especially since there's nothing else there. Um, and if it's not doing any harm, um, then, I, then why not just leave it in place? It's beautiful to stand there at the bridge and look at that area. Now, on the Pacific Street, there's nothing much planted there. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if, um, and the eucalyptus tree, obviously not doing any harm. Um, and eucalyptus are native to the Americas, by the way, far longer than they were in Australia. I think this could be a great project for like permaculture experts from Esalen Institute and in Santa Cruz to do a partner project with the city of Monterey and see what they can do to stop the erosion and also introduce um, friendly plants that are going to make that much more, uh, it's going to be beautiful from the Pacific side, side as well as from um, uh, the Hartnell side. So those are my comments. Thank you. Okay, any other member of the public should make any comments? Okay, let's open it up to uh, downtown rep and the commission. I don't have any comments. Anyone? Oh, yeah. I can't see who has hands up or not in the council chamber. So this is this is Bella. Yeah, who's talking? So speaking. As the projects are as written, as submitted. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Richard. Yeah, I have a couple comments, just a little history. Maybe uh, uh, <clears throat> the shower on Wharf 2, that was there for decades. It was heavily used, but when the city remodeled the restroom, they took it out. So yes, I think it's, it's very much needed, especially on that beach. Um, I do have concerns about the youth center and how much money we put into it because it's on the city designated plans for uh, sea level rise. It will be underwater. And it's also directly in the line of the tsunami uh, danger, which we have in Monterey Bay. And that's well documented and the city plans. So we have to watch how much money we put into it. And I'd like to get some clarification on whether Parks and Rec considered those existing plans. Um, uh, Hartnell Gulch, I spent a lot of time at the library and I've looked down in that gulch. I've never seen so much toilet paper in my life down there. There are camps going on down there. It's an environmental hazard. Um, nobody goes down there to clean it up because it's all poison oak. So um, we definitely need to look at that. Um, and on the Dennis Menes security cameras, uh, Tom Rowley and I sponsored the project at the Presidio on the Yennepper Serra statue, and we managed to get a camera up there. The city council approved it, but we had severe limitations because the only way to transmit the signal was over AT&T line, a phone line. So it, it has severe limitations. It's monitored by a security company. 24 hours a day. But this is in response to them stealing Dennis the Menace twice already uh, and what goes on there at night. So it's worth investigating to see if we can do that. With the youth center there, we have the Wi Fi, we have the power. It's a different situation with the camera. But the city council really, really needs to look at cameras and what Carmel and PG are doing with license plate readers. Folks, they're stopping felonies. They're stopping rapes and robberies. It's working in Carmel. And I think we need to get more proactive about this. 
Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm going to speak to DT1. Uh, <laughs> back in 1999, we had an overflow crowd of people wanting needing a restroom in that area of Window on the Bay. And usage has only gone up. And the council never got around to doing anything about it. First, it got held up with the down, with the beach plan. Then it was the wharf plan. Then it was the harbor plan. Then it was the next thing and the other. But in the meantime, people use the bushes. Uh, we need a restroom there, and we need it now. Uh, this was funded originally in 1999. It's the poster child for things not happening. So I'll get off my soapbox now. Uh, anyone else have any comments? Tom Riley, uh, I concur with Rick's comments. Absolutely. The guy that originally proposed this now lives in Florida. <laughs> I'm surprised he's still alive. It's been so long. And Jean also has her hand raised. Yep. Go ahead, Jean. Thank you. I, I would appreciate knowing the life expectancy of the turf, the artificial turf, so that when we get the number of the cost, we can kind of figure how long that's gonna last. I'd appreciate that. And um, I had the same question about the toxicity and maybe someone can educate me. Um, I was educated last night at Parks and Recs about the artificial turf has its own drainage <clears throat> system, which I thought was great. The water is contained and goes back into the ground. Um, but if what we're doing is putting toxins back in there, then ultimately will we have made a mistake? So I would just like some education on that to relieve my own mind. I, I joined Nina in that. Those are my two questions. Okay. Richard, do you still have your hand up for another question or? Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, anyone else in the council chamber sets their hands up? One more. Yep. Yep. Uh, Tom, Two. Tom Raleigh, uh, Rich and I put in the one on the Unipra Sarah statute, which has been successful. Um, I saw a comment in the Herald article about the Dennis the Menace Park statue being put someplace else other than Dennis the Menace Park. I think that is a mistake. I mean, that's giving in to vandals. If we don't put it back, in some place and make it secure and put some surveillance on it, we are giving way to the vandals that created this problem. So I, I think we should really push. And if this parks and rec, I didn't see their notes, whether they talked about that, but this was something Karen Larson uh, mentioned. It was in the interview that she gave to the Herald. So <laughs> I think if we can have some kind of influence to say, put it back where it is and make it secure. That's what we need to push for. Okay, we'll get more information on that. Then um, Dennis had his hand up and Dave does also. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I kind of recall, didn't we do a study of Hartnell Gulch before? Yes. And what its planning was supposed to be and how it was going to become uh, naturally changed to what it was supposed to have been? Yes, there's a, a preliminary design that we have a copy of and um, I can get a slide of that for the next presentation, but it's been designed and it's this section. Um, so it will be regraded some, um, there will be all new plantings installed there. Some of the trees are, well, uh, I'll have to look at the plan in detail. I think that this question has been asked and answered with the previous study. Yes. And then Dave had his hand up as well. Oh, Dave. question answered. Okay, so let's move on to Fish Flats. Fisherman's Flats, there are four projects nominated this year. The first one is uh, on Via Casoli. It's a sewer odor mitigation issue, originally submitted in 2015. Uh, the second project is uh, for a street light at the end of Via, I always say Maritimo, but I think it's Maritimo. Uh, project number three is at Via Isolo and Jocelyn Canyon Road. It's to rehabilitate the entry walls to the neighborhood. And project number four is at Fisherman's Flats Park. It's to replace a number of trees that were um, 
removed or fell down or are no longer there. Um, this was originally proposed in 2019. And those are the four Fisherman Flats projects. Okay, we'll open it up to general public for anyone having any comments or questions on the Fisherman's Flats projects. Uh, just a quick thing on FF4. Tom, um, you're not public, are you? I'm just clarifying that some part of that project's been completed. Install the doggy poop bag receptacles and an additional garbage can near each entrance. So the only part that's left is to get a tree that replaced Okay, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak to the Fish Flats projects? Okay, seeing none, now we'll open up to the to the committee. Uh, I, I've got a question on Fish Flats 2. Do we have the signatures of the property owners yet? No. Okay. We will need that before voting night. Yeah, it, and it's unlikely that the neighbor has changed his mind. That's where I was headed. Any other questions or comments on any of them? Tom, do you want to speak to any of them? <laughs> nope. Uh, Just that uh, Hope Rogers, who put in, I think, two of the projects. Number one, she lives in Carmel Valley now. And also number four, she lives in Carmel Valley. So, um, okay. But the need for replace trees in the park is still still a valid need and uh i i think that uh, the ff1 was to verify with the maintenance people at the school district that they did whatever they needed to do at their end which feeds into that sewer line so that's still a verification thing that staff was jeff krebs promised to do that four years ago Ooh. <laughs> okay <laughs> Blame it on Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments or questions on Fish Flats projects? Seeing none, we'll move on to the last neighborhood for tonight, Monterey Vista. And we'll just mention that there are no projects nominated this year for oh, Glenwood. Sorry, I missed Glenwood. Yeah. And then Monterey Vista. Right through. Project number one is uh, originally proposed in 2012. It was for signage to the freeways at Munros and Avenue and Soledad Drive. Uh, project number two is at Via Del Rey and Herman. Streetlight installation, there was a project NTIP undertook several or more years ago. Um, and the last piece was to get the streetlight installed there, which hasn't happened yet. Uh, project number three is for Monterey Vista street markings. Uh, we had a note. Is it? Do we have it? It's not operation. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the project number three is for Monterey Vista street markings. And we had a note in the file that this project was completed in 20, the fall fiscal year 22 under measure S. So this one could be removed from the list. As can project number four, uh, the for the street name signs in Monterey Vista. This one was also completed. Those two orig were um, originally approved and they automatically were returned. Uh, another one that is automatically returned is um, San Bernabe for the road design. Uh, project number six is for Monterey Vista traffic calming. And you heard Reggie earlier, this will be going to um, city council for approval of the traffic calming plan. Oh, I'm sorry. The traffic calming plan itself will be going to a council next month for approval. This would be to construct the first phase of the project, which is the Mar Vista, Tota Vista Drive um, improvements that are in, included in the plan. Project number seven is at Via Paraiso Park. It's the basketball court upgrade. This one also was a, a priority project for the Parks and Rec Commission last night. They um, counted it as number 10 on their list of the highest 12. Project number eight is for a, a conduit installation pilot project in Monterey Vista. Project number 10 
is a Via Gaiuba at Walter Colton Drive. It's an always stop control installation. So they want to put stop signs on Via Gaiuba and Walter Colton. And traffic's note on this one was, let me find it and read it. But it was, um, there is a study that needs to happen to see whether it's warranted to place stop signs there. Um, next page their comment was uh staff recommends that this scope be changed to include all way stop warrant analysis prior to installing any stop sign traffic control devices such as stop signs must demonstrate that they meet the california manual traffic control devices warrants prior to installation so we'll change the description of that to include that as well Then the next project is number 11 at Via Prizo Park. It's to uh, upgrade the playground, the existing playground equipment. Uh, project number 12, also at Via Prizo Park, is the pickleball court improvements, which we approved um, earlier this evening. Project number 13 is a Herman Drive El Hamanito pedestrian crosswalk with uh, rapid rectangular flashing beacons so would 12 come off the list 12 can come off the list yes okay and traffic on this one said uh staff recommends a traffic study be done prior to design and construction of an uncontrolled pedestrian crossing study should address feasibility and applicability of an uncontrolled crosswalk including considerations for the lack of receiving pedestrian facilities and visibility assessment, which means that there um, could be a crosswalk there, but there's no sidewalks going up El Camanito. And those are the 13 projects in Monterey Vista. Okay, we'll open it up to the general public for any comments on Monterey Vista projects. Uh, I see, uh, uh, Ray Myers online. Uh, good evening. Um, five years ago, November 2018, the city of Monterey was in the process of passing Measure S, authorizing the city to renew the local sales tax dedicated to funding repairs of streets, sidewalks, and sewers. It passed with 82% of the vote. Some of us at the time argued that this measure should be include a provision to relocate utility lines underground as the roads were reconstructed in accordance with our city's big ones policy. However, this reasoning didn't get through and added to Measure S and the, a proposed alternative pilot program was submitted and approved through NCIP to underground the conduit, conduit only for future undergrounding efforts when the streets reconstructed. Unfortunately, this NCIP project along with others never happened due to the withdrawal by the city for financial constraints of the pandemic. So now five years later, this project makes even more sense as the cost of underground power lines is mostly due to having to dig up the roads, which is already done during reconstruction of the street. If we don't have the funds now to remove utility poles and to bury the lines, why not at least put in this conduit at this time and be ready when the funds are available move the utilities underground at a later date. No more digging costs in the future, just the pulling of the conductors through the conduit, which will be already safely in the ground. So be, be a, a word quickly about undergrounding. Uh, beyond the obvious aesthetic issues with power lines, there are many reasons to underground our utility lines. Uh, above ground equipment fails, and it fails more often than lines installed underground. There are above ground power lines, these particular pose for significant safety risks to us. When above ground lines undergo a power delivery failure, no matter what the cause of it, the failure can easily put pedestrians, vehicles, and property in harm's way. Significant events cause these failures when coupled with utility lines situated above ground can result in the blocking of our escape and emergency routes. Age and old above ground infrastructure, when you add this to climate change, you can produce catastrophic events. With our ever increasing climate change risks, risk of fire ignition comes to mind by power lines 
go up as vegetation becomes drier and the winds increase. Our recent winter storms remind us how vulnerable we really are losing power too in our communication when the trees fall on the power lines. Before long in the summer, during the fire season, we will likely once again experience an increased number of rolling brownouts due to pu public safety power shutoffs. Utilities are placed safely underground and a priority is given to power generation located closer to the point of use. Our power grid will become more resilient, which go a long way to ensure how we have safe and uninterrupted power and communication into the future. This proposed NCIP pilot project will demonstrate that it always will make sense to place conduit in ground as the roads are being reconstructed, which is precisely what is meant by dig once. It made sense in 2018 when it was approved for NCIP and it makes more sense today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Myers. I believe that's Nina 902. Yes, it's Nina. Thank you. Okay. Um, the stop at Via Gayuba and Walter Colton, if you, any of you are parents and have kids at that school, you know how busy that intersection is. It just makes sense to put stop signs there. It doesn't take a long, detailed, expensive study. Um, I think a lot of the parents that have their kids there can testify to the need for that just on a, as a safety issue. Um, so yes, definitely stop signs um, and as soon as possible. Um, I did not realize that the uh, pickleball court installation was was in the prior uh, item because I was overjoyed to see that the city was talking about a pickleball court out at Ryan Ranch where there are no homes nearby. But I've sat in city council meetings and planning commission meetings and heard residents around that park complain about noise and I really don't understand why homeowners or renters that live adjacent to parks, their concerns aren't prioritized to be able to have a quiet evening, a quiet weekend where you don't have noise coming from uh, percussive, the percussive sounds of, of balls, hard balls. Um, that's really, I mean, if your home isn't your sanctuary, there is no other place. So. I'm very opposed to the use of Via Paraiso, which has homes all along one side, in two sides of it, being used for something that has everywhere that these uh, games go, there are noise complaints. You know that, and I know that, and it just seems like this is degrading um, a neighborhood rather than enhancing the neighborhood. And as I said, I am overjoyed that there is a there is plan are plans for a place for people to go and just be able to enjoy themselves without having to worry about nearby neighbors. But I think that neighbors have to be prioritized when a park is adjacent to their homes. They have to be safe in their homes to be able to have serenity and peace and quiet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other members of the public? Yes, one in person here in the chamber. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, it's uh, it's Bruce Zanetta uh, from Monterey Vista Neighborhood. And I wanted to speak to the same thing that um, Ray Myers is speaking to, MV08, um, the undergrounding. Um, it's the undergrounding conduit um, that we previously had. And then at COVID, it was, uh, and it was approved. And then during COVID, of course, it was put on hold. Um, it's back on the table and the timing couldn't be more um, provocative, uh, poignant. Um, the, with the storms that we've had, um, the recognition that we need to harden our, our utility grid is, is really obvious. Um, and, and this particular winter, um, because of where the, the grid went down, um, if the entire city had been undergrounded, we would have not only uh, been had power a lot more, but um, Pacific Grove would have and uh, um, uh, Del Monte Forest, all, all of them coming off our section of the grid. Um, the, it's an anti antiquated grid. It's designed like a tree, shaped like a tree. And that's why um, hitting some certain areas would have or putting some certain parts of it at least underground would have made a big difference. Um, 
uh, as Ray pointed out, climate change is, is changing that game. And now we should really be focused on the ways we can harden our grid and also uh, uh, get our, our uh, power generation closer to home, close, closer to our businesses. Um, so um, let me get back on track here because I lost my place here. Um, so what what we would like to do if you decide that this is something to, to for NCIP to, to bring back on the table here, um, what our committee, which is the two neighborhood um, undergrounding committee would like to do is put, to, uh, put together essentially two lists, one from public works that which would be those, those uh, a list of those streets that are still left to be reconstructed so that we can stick to our uh, dig once policy on that. And then the other one is a list from PG&E, which would show where on that tree would make the biggest impact. Now, mind you, this is only conduit. However, it is possible to approach PG&E, and I would, I would be willing to do this um, and say, look, we're gonna put this conduit in. It's, it's, it's your, to your benefit that you use some of the funds that go to PG&E to actually put the line in and, and put it to work right away. If that's a part of that trunk of the tree, that's gonna make a difference. Um, we can, maybe we can get them on board as well. I would suggest another thing too, and, and that is the Del, that Del Monte Forest and PG&E um, that were taken out by our, our, the grid in our area would also sign onto that. And maybe there's some money to be found beyond that NCIP to kind of match it. I don't know, there's a lot of ways to do this, but what I do know is, is as Ray pointed out, climate change has changed that game and we need to start acting on that. Thank you. And another? Just one more comment on that particular undergrounding projects. We, uh, our neighborhood always does a complete survey of our neighborhood on all the projects. And when this project was first uh, submitted, it was, uh, it was a citywide project, but within our neighborhood, it was the highest rated project that our neighborhood wanted funded of all the, I think we had 13 projects that year in our, in our neighborhood, and that was the highest, uh, highest rated project. So um, it is really supported by uh, at least the residents of Monterey Vista. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other Members of the public. If not, we'll bring it back to the commission. Jean, do you want to speak to any of your project? Well, I had a I had a question for staff on the Herman Drive and El Caminito pedestrian crosswalk that we need the traffic study that makes total sense to me. How how do you remind me how this works when we have one of these traffic projects do do we get do we get the traffic study first before we vote on it or do we vote on it and then it maybe stalls because it never was a good idea in terms of um the science of traffic yes we could do it two ways you could have a project for the study or you could include the study as a specific part of the project which may be the the more efficient way to do it um, the study would be done, we'd have to do that before doing any construction just to make sure it's warranted at that location, so. But we could alter the project Description. to be inclusive of the study. I'm trying to see who submitted it. Christina Magel. Do we need her consent or if it's essential, we just do it? add in the study normally we'd have her consent because she submitted it and it is a, it's an addition to it so so is that going to be imperative to the project I, I guess i'm asking for guidance on how the traffic projects go we would not be able to construct the crosswalk or do any improvements until the study was completed okay so i'll call her and ask if that's okay yes okay yep. thank you any other questions or comments on any of your projects, Jane? No, thank you. Okay, I, I've got a question on MB10. That's the uh, stop signs. 
what is involved to do a stop sign warrant? Isn't that just in effect filling out a form? No, it's more than that. That will do a lot of research actually is involved because I have to look at collisions and um, probably traffic counts and uh, I can find out more details before the next meeting, but it's, it's more, a lot more research. and um, There's a lot more to it than just filling out a form, unfortunately. And, and if it's found it to be warranted, the city would just put up the stop signs, correct? We could, yes. So in effect, this really should change to be a, the warranting stop signs. And if warranted, it's kind of like what Gene was talking about on the other one, where the studies got to be, should be in it and then move forward with the stop signs if it's warranted. Yeah. Um, yes, sorry. And, and yeah. Hans just mentioned he has more information on this one that he could provide. <laughs> So after I talked with a submitter who called me on the phone, I talked with Andrea and about this, and she said, yes, a study like this needs to be done. It needs, it cannot be done by like residents or so counting cars. It needs to be done professionally. And I think she estimated that a study like this would be about 200 K. So, and would take a while. 200 K so. for a stop sign study. Yep. Whoa. For People out there yeah. counting for certain amounts of hours and days. Oh, and yeah. No, I'm, I'm I just so, uh, Gene, you might want to see with the submitter and have it be the study and whether we'll, yeah, we can cough up 200 grand. We'll have to see. You know, we used to get interns during the summer to do stuff like this. <laughs> I have an 18 year old at home. <laughs> On a neighborhood store. Uh, any other comments or questions on Monterey Vista projects? I see no hands raised. Okay. In which case, we'll close out this agenda item. Uh, and we'll move on to agenda item six, which is the meeting schedule. Thank you. And just, um, we'll keep this quick because it's getting late. Um, well. It's real late for me. Yeah, I bet it is. Yeah, we'll get you. Yeah. Um, this is just to, so we um, missed our March 30th meeting. We <laughs> pushed it back to tonight, which was on the schedule. The proposal right now is to modify the calendar to add another meeting next Thursday when we can look at the second round, the second half of projects um, and complete our first review, which will put us back in on to the schedule for the meeting on the 27th to be the second review where we're soliciting comments from the public um, for the first half of neighborhoods. So basically we had on the original calendar that this, the, the meet on April 20th would be a tentative meeting if we didn't get completed with business tonight. So we're just trying to make that a, uh, a hard meeting where we can, complete the second half, the first review, second half of projects. And then we're back on the regular schedule at that point. Correct. On the 27th then. Quick schedule related question. Usually when we get back to that second round with the public comments and we're trying to get our neighborhoods out here to speak to it, we also are prioritizing at that meeting. And so that means we've usually surveyed the neighborhoods and to do that, we usually give them the prices because they often look at, at the costs when they decide what their priorities are. So that would mean we would need the costs and time to complete the, the surveys before the 27th of April. Okay. Time flies. Okay. So is everyone clear on the schedule? We have a meeting next week. It should be second half of neighborhoods. And Jean, you will need to chair that meeting because I will be traveling that day. Okay, any, let's move on. If there's no questions on the schedule, let's move on to uh, member comments. Do we need to vote on that schedule? Tom, do we need to vote? 
I was thinking that we did just to make the change. Well, yeah. except it's already on our schedule. It's just what's done on that day is what's different. But let's go ahead. I'll make a motion that we redesignate next week's meeting to be the second, the committee review of the second half of the neighborhoods. I'll second that. Second. Ah. <laughs> okay. I need discussion on the motion. We could have a roll call, please. Alta Mesa? Aye. Casanova Oak Knoll? Aye. Deer Flat? Aye. Del Monte Beach? Aye. Del Monte Grove Laguna Grande? Aye. Downtown? Aye. Fisherman's Flat? Aye. Glenwood? Aye. Monterey Vista? Aye. New Monterey? Aye. Oak Grove? Aye. Old Town? Aye. Skyline? Aye, aye, aye. aye. Via Del Monte? Aye. Thank you. A motion carries. The next week is second half of the neighborhood's review. Uh, okay, let's move on to commission comments. And Tom, if you could stop sharing your screen, it just makes the other pictures bigger. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, who has a comment, a general comment? Chinieri. Uh, so I got word. Go ahead. Uh, so I got word that um, one of our projects were being added back for consideration. So I think that would take us to a total of 15 projects. It was New Monterey 19. I don't know if it's in the, I don't think it's in the book. It's, um, we sent an email out um, okay. last week with that, the information, the original application just to the committee members. So that one project, it was it was my mistake. Um, it was not. It was for the um, hilltop mm -hmm. center, and it was um, we thought it was a duplicate project, but it was intended to be uh, another like a facelift project uh, rather than the ones that we had on for which was a study. So it was mistakenly removed at the February twenty third meeting, and it's back on. Great. Just wanted to confirm that. Thank you. Hey, uh, Richard. Yes, uh, I, I, I want to put out some praise for Reggie. I, I did talk to him about the beach mats. Uh, it should be a priority because it's manufactured, installed, not requiring staff. And he got right on it. And it's going to be installed now. Um, we need to praise him for that. And also, I brought up the Oak study, which was has been dormant for three or four years. Uh, within two weeks, we got samples taken, not just my neighborhood, but elsewhere in the city. They're in the laboratory now for broad spectrum analysis. Uh, I'm estimating we have lost in Casanova Oak, no, well over half of our oak trees. And it looks like another 20 or 30% of the remainder are in trouble. So I don't know if we're going to get an answer. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get a solution, but at least we're trying. Thank you. Nice Thank short you. meeting. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, let's see who's got hands up in the council chambers. I see someone waving their hand at me. That was April. In January. April. I wanted to reiterate what Richard just said. I've been more than, you know, COVID set us all back, you know, huge amounts, but I've seen more progress in the last year between Reggie coming on board and Tom and Cody than I've seen previously. <laughs> I mean, it's like you ask something and it gets done. So. <laughs> hey, who else has got hands up? Uh, that is me. I just want to say again this the same thing. And also I'm I'm looking forward to getting to go with Louie and Parks now that we have some money and getting some stuff done again because we had a number of years out there where things just started to fall apart. So it's going to be exciting to get some stuff done. Rick, safe travels from Argentina. Thank you. And I, I've got I also want to echo with Cody and 
not sure if he was involved or who, but it was nice to, I was surprised how quick the eucalyptus tree came down and they actually got PG&E to do half of it. All the parts from the lines up. So uh, kudos. That was uh, cool. <laughs> and it was a big tree. <laughs> uh I, as I indicated I, I didn't get a reaction from Jean so I just want to make sure she realizes that she gets to chair next week <laughs> I got it <laughs> okay <laughs> unfortunately I'm in the air so uh and, and I'll be back in town for the subsequent you. meeting <laughs> do we yeah, have just, any uh, other uh, comments uh, if we're getting ready citywide are we going to revert back to the neighborhood improvement program <laughs> I actually brought that up and uh, question, it was actually pointed out that in the charter, it actually had the C in it, but yeah. I said, yeah. how can we not have sit community wide if our name is neighborhood improvement, neighborhood and community improvement fund and that didn't go over real well. <laughs> Luz, go ahead. I, I just want to mention um, that I will be out of town next week, but I believe I can still join you through Zoom. Am I correct? Yes. Whatever I am, I've done that before. Yes, we'll have to get the, uh, the physical address of where you will be attending from. But yes, we can make that happen, Luz. We'll follow up with you this week. Well, yeah, I, I will get the, the emails and, and the... Um, access um, link and so what i'm saying is i intend to watch it wherever i am okay okay the uh just so everyone else knows too we will be turning around the agenda will go up tomorrow it's friday already so the next meeting will be next week on thursday so we'll get the agenda out to you tomorrow so it'd be a quick turnaround. If anyone else is not going to make it, um, if you could give us your the physical address of where you'd be attending from, we can uh, put you on the agenda and then you'll be able to vote on everything. Sure. I can send you the address. Okay. Uh, if there's no other comments, uh, we are adjourned. And it's only midnight. Rick. Set a record. Can you feel love? I got a rate. Okay. Run. No, no, no. Just take it.